In baseband transmission, the transmitted signal power lies at low frequencies, typically around 0. It is desirable in many digital communication system for the same reason as in analog communication system for the transmitted signal to lie in a frequency band toward the high end of the spectrum. And this is achieved by encoding digital information has a variation of the parameters of a sinusoidal signal called the carrier signal. Typically as for analog communication systems, the carrier frequency chosen is much higher than the highest frequency in the modulating signal. So, there are three basic forms of digital modulation and these are as follows. So, here this is the carrier with the amplitude A, frequency F and the phase theta. If we, the, if the amplitude A of the carrier is varied in proportion to the information signal, then what we get a digital modulated signal called as amplitude shift key. If the frequency of this carrier is varied, then we get what is known as frequency shift key. And if the phase theta of this carrier is varied in proportional to the information signal, then a digital modulated signal we get is what is known as phase shift key. Now, if both the amplitude and the phase theta of the carrier are varied proportional to the information or message signal, a digital modulated signal is generated called quadrature amplitude modulation COM, Q A M, quadrature amplitude modulation. Okay. The probably the first type of digital modulation to be practically applied was amplitude shift keying. So, we will start with our study on binary amplitude shift keying in short BSK. So, we will denote the transmitted signal ST has product of modulating signal MT and CT is the carrier. MT is the modulating baseband signal and CT is the sinusoidal carrier in the form of cos 2 pi FCT, FC is the carrier frequency. Let me just show you the waveform for such a modulation scheme. Let us assume that we have binary data in the form of 10110001 and it has been converted to a line code using a unipolar scheme. So, for 1 we have a pulse and for 0 we do not have a pulse. And this becomes your modulating signal MT and it modulates the carrier cos 2 pi FCT. So, the output which you will get is shown here. So, whenever there is a 1, you transmit the carrier, whenever it is 0, you put it off. So, in binary amplitude shift keying, a sinusoidal carrier that is cos 2 pi FCT is gated on and off by the binary digit or bit sequence to be transmitted. So, this is your binary ASK modulation. And in its simplest form, it has been used for radio telegraphy transmission in MOS code. So, the let us look at the signal set for this transmission. We have two signals for symbol 1, 
signal would be S 1 T which is given here with the amplitude given this by root of 2 E T B. Now, the reason for choosing this kind of an amplitude is that if you find out the energy in this signal S 1 T then it will turn out to be E and that is the reason for writing the amplitude in this form. And the other signal S 2 T is equal to 0 for the symbol corresponding to 0 binary digit. Both these signals are over the bit duration which we denote by T B. So, received signal would be equal to S i T plus W T where we assume that W T is additive white Gaussian noise of 0 mean and the two sided power spectral density as usual is given by italic n by 2 watts per hertz. So, depending on which symbol we have transmitted this S i t will take one of this form. Now, the first thing when we will try to analyze all this modulation scheme is that we have to decide how to represent this signal set in terms of signal vectors. So, what we are looking is basically to get the signal constellation or the signal space diagram for the given signal set. So, in this case it is very easy to see for the these two signals which we have, we have only one orthonormal basis signal and that basis signal we can choose to be as phi 1 t is equal to S 1 t normalized by the energy E. So, this will become now of energy 1 over the duration 0 to T B. Uh, one more thing to remember that if we choose F C to be some integer multiplication of 1 by T B, then the energy in this will always turn out to be 1. But if it is not integer multiple of F C, then approximately it will be equal to 1 because when we integrate this over the duration 0 to T B for large value of F C, we can show that this will turn out to be equal to 1. Now, so signal constellation for this would be given as follows. So, first is the S 1 T signal I take the projection of that signal onto phi 1 T I will get it root E that means the S 1 1 denotes the the projection of the signal S 1 T onto phi 1 that so S 1 1 is equal to root E and the projection of the signal S 2 T onto phi 1 T is equal to 0. So, S 2 1 that means, this one denotes the projection on the phi 1 basis signal and 2 here denotes the signal. So, S 2 t is being projected on phi 1 t and that value is equal to 0. So, the signal space diagram or signal constellation will look as shown here. So, this is 0. Okay. Now, given this once we have the signal constellation, once we know the orthonormal basis signal, it is very easy to find out the optimum detector for this. We have done this based on our results which we have studied earlier. Immediately we can write the optimum detector for this case binary amplitude shift key which is as shown in this figure you have in the form of correlation receiver we have implemented and the comparator here. In general this would be the threshold depending on the probability for the transmission of the symbol 1 and symbol 0, but for our study unless stated otherwise we will assume that probability P 1 is equal to P 2. In that case the threshold for this will turn out to be root E by 2 correct half of this perpendicular bisector exactly. 
we get this this is thing okay and then calculation of the probability error is again straightforward we have this signal constellation decision boundary is midpoint this side is r2 region this side is r1 region and we have seen how to calculate the probability of error for any two equiprobable signals and immediately we can write here the probability of error is q times the distance divided by 2 and the standard deviation of the noise we are projecting the noise onto the phi 1 axis which is orthonormal axis therefore the variance remains as italic n by 2 so standard deviation is square root of that and we get this quantity now it's always more logical to express this ratios in terms of average bit energy specifically when we move over to the uh, higher constellations where more than two signals are involved that time we would be interested in finding out uh, uh, this expression in terms of bit energy so if we do this in our case here the average bit energy will be equal to e by 2 because probability of 0 is half probability of sending 1 is half s2 has zero energy s1 has e energy so the average bit energy turns out to be e by 2 so if i plug in this equation i get this okay fine and the last thing we are supposed to do whenever we will be evaluating the different modulation scheme is to evaluate the power spectral density of a particular modulation scheme so in general this idea concept will be useful for evaluating the power spectral density if i have a signal st which is a product of a stationary random process and a cost function like this which i have shown here where theta is a random variable so from our study in random processes we know that the power spectral density for this signal st would be given in terms of the power spectral density of mt which is stationary random process and the carrier frequency fc right now in our case for binary ask your mt is of this form p can be anything but in the diagram which i had displayed your pulse basic pulse was chosen to be rectangle but it could be anything it could be race cosine type also so for but for our study just now we will restrict ourselves to the rectangle pulses without loss of generality so in our case now alpha k can take two values 0 and a this a is nothing but root of 2e by tb it's easy for me to write the things in terms of a so we will write in terms of a but remember a is equal to this quantity ok. So using this relationship we know how to calculate the power spectral density for this modulating signal mt correct. This we have studied earlier so we will use the results from there this is nothing but a unipolar line code and for the unipolar line code we have the result here we have derived this is the power spectral density for the unipolar line code and using that the Fourier transform of PT is PF if we use a rectangular type of a shape for the PT then the PF is given by this expression and using these expressions we can plug into this expression for the power spectral density of the modulated signal is a straightforward thing so if you do that we get this expression this expression is little bit approximation there would be another term which is sine of this quantity upon pi tb f minus fc squared multiplied by sine pi tb f plus 
f c upon pi t b f plus f c correct. But f c being very large we can neglect that cross product term. So, approximately this would be equal to this and this is very clear I mean what I am saying is it will become very clear if you look at the diagram for the power spectral density which you will get from here. So, I am just showing you on the positive side of the frequency axis the same thing will be valid on the left hand side of this figure. The right hand side this would be the power spectral density. Remember this has impulses at 0, 1 by T b, 2 by T b and all that, but the impulses at 1 by T b, 2 by T b and ahead will be suppressed because of the zeros at the this position 1 by T b, 2 by T b due to the same function. So, you do not see the impulses out here and you see only one impulse at F c. So, this is what you will get for the power spectral density for the binary amplitude shift keying. Now, it looks like an infinite type of thing. So, remember what I was saying about the cross product is something like this because in practice this goes up to the infinity on both the side. So, this could go really into the left hand side and the left hand whatever is here is on there on the left hand side also. So, the right portion of that left hand side will also trickle into this portion but we are saying that this f c frequency is quite high correct. So, if the f c frequency is very high by the time it goes in this side of the axis this lobes would have died down ok. So, that is the basically what I meant by was that cross product terms is neglected. So, this is if you calculate that you will find that 95 percent of the total transmitted power lies in the band of 3 by T b hertz centered at f c. Correct. So, this helps us to decide the bandwidth of the binary amplitude shift keying uh, modulation schemes. Okay. Now, another popular modulation scheme is what is known as binary phase shift keying. And this binary phase shift keying scheme is used in modern communication systems such as satellite links, wideband, microwave, radio relay stations etcetera. And this is very power efficient in terms of signal power and we will see this soon. So, this is what happens we will be talking about the coherent BPSK where I assume that I know the phase of my carrier signal and here without loss of generality I have assumed that carrier phase to be equal to 0, but it is important to know that we are talking about coherent BPSK. Okay. So, for symbol 1 I have this expression and for symbol 2 I have just the negative sorry I repeat for the symbol 0 I have this S 2 signal given by this which is just the negative of S 1 T. And uh, if you look at the, so here I show you the how the BPSK will look for the same digital data which we want to transmit. So, earlier we had seen that this was binary ASK. Now, this is your binary PSK. So, for 1 we have this cos waveform going for 0 basically it changes the phase. So, suddenly it changes like this and then again you have 1. So, again it changes the phase here it comes and then again there is 1. So, it continues with the same thing. So, this how you generate the BPSK signal. It is very easy to see that the signal constellation can be obtained with the help of just one basis signal we will use phi 1 t to be the basis signal over this duration and then using this we can calculate the signal constellation. The signal constellation is as shown here this is your point 0. So, S 1 t is given here and S 2 t has been given here. So, if you take the projections of the signals onto a phi 1 t 
S11 I will get plus E and S21 I will get it to be minus E. Remember this is a one dimensional signal space. Once we have phi 1 t we can immediately get the optimum detector. Again the optimum detector is as shown here in the form of correlation receiver. Phi 1 t you correlate with R t, you sample it at t equal to T b and then you put it to a comparator. The threshold is going to be 0 because the both the symbols are equiprobable. So, we will get P 1 is equal to P 2. When R 1 that is the projection onto the and if it is greater than threshold I decide 1 has been transmitted. So, 1 d means that the decision is in favor of the symbol 1 and if this R 1 is less than the threshold which is 0 I decide that 0 has been transmitted. So, 0 d means the decision is in favor of 0. Given this now again very simple looking at the signal constellation we can immediately write down the probability of error. Remember in this case also the probability of error is symmetric whether I transmit S 2 t or whether I transmit S 1 t the probability of error is going to be the same conditional probability of errors are same. So, the conditional probability of errors are same the probability of error would be equal to the conditional error probability of any one of the signal. So, it is easy to calculate the probability of error in this case that would be given by looking at the signal constellation the distance is 2 root e. So, 2 root e distance divide by 2 standard deviation of the noise remember the noise is being projected onto the orthonormal axis phi 1. So, the variance of the noise remains the same that is italic n by 2. So, the standard deviation is the square root of this I calculate in this case the bit energy turns out to be the same as the energy E of the each of the signal S 1 t and S 2 t right? equiprobable and then I get this. Now, and the last thing we have to do is basically calculate the power spectral density for this. So, for the power spectral density we use the same expressions as we did for the binary ASK case. The only difference is that I have to evaluate now power spectral density for empty signal. In this case my empty signal value of alpha k in empty signal will be equal to minus a and plus a where a is given by root of 2 e by T b. And we know that this is a polar line code we have evaluated the power spectral density for a polar line code is given by this expression and we choose p t to be rectangle pulse given a rectangle pulse I get my p f from this and using this relationship I just plug into this equation I get my power spectral density for the binary phase shift keying scheme. And if you plot this it will look as shown in this figure again I am just showing the right side of the frequency axis the left hand side has not been showed. So, this is 0 exactly the same thing will be there on the left hand side. The difference between BPSK and BSK is that in BPSK there is an absence of the carrier at FC that is the only difference and again just for the sake of completion I would like to point out that we have neglected the cross product term in this case also and it is not difficult to see from where that cross product term would come. So, it is because this trickles onto the left hand side and this thing is also there on the left hand side. So, the lobes from the left hand side could trickle into the right hand side 
and that also has to be accounted when we plot this. But if Fc is very high, then these lobes will die out. Right? And um, so again, we can find out the bandwidth for this signal BPSK, which is as same as for the BSK case. Now, the next parameter of the carrier wave which we can change is the frequency and if we do that basically we will get what is known as binary phase shift key and this we will study next time. Thank you.